I am finding that even my comments in the comment threads, and I'm trying to have productive conversations, uh, someone, I, I did, uh, and I don't want to call this person by name because I don't, you know, don't do that typically in my videos. I, I, you never know who's going to read what and hear what. I don't want to uncover anybody. Um, but someone said, you know, look, I didn't call you a heretic after this last one, but they did say they had concerns, you know, for sure about me taking a book like James and saying it's not inspired. And I, I get that because all scripture is God breathed and inspira inspired and, uh, profitable for our instruction, you know, in righteousness so that we can be fully furnished a man of God equipped for everything we need. Right. I, so I agree with that in a sense. And maybe I was too strong to say James is not inspired, but when I say inspired, I mean like Paul was clearly speaking and knew he was speaking from divine revelation from heaven when he wrote. Um, now, this all scripture is God breathed and in the canon, I believe, was preserved and put together by the Holy Spirit through men. Uh, and yet you got to take it as all so the, the, you know I, I grew up under Chuck Missler was a great teacher and he said you know here we have 66 books written over thousands of years by more than 40 authors in three languages and yet we find that it is an integrated message system in which every detail is put there by Design, deliberately designed for the Holy Spirit so that there is a transcendent intention, an intention of a divine author that transcends the immediate intention of the human authors. Okay? But it's the whole message system that's inspired. And yes, every detail is arranged by the Holy Spirit in it to instruct us about something. Now take the law. We know now because of Paul's clear statements that the law does not profit because of the weakness of the flesh and that it's a ministry of condemnation and death and that it only brings wrath and it only brings the curse because we are lawbreakers. And therefore it was given specifically to cause sin to abound and magnify it by getting us to try to do it so that we could discover the sin in our nature as another principle. You can't, you, that is Paul's revelation, which we must now accept as we come to the law, realizing that it was given by God in that sense, but we are not under it. And yet it, yet we are admonished to keep it in the old Testament. How can you reconcile that? And that same argument, all scripture is God-breathed and inspired, is used by law-keeping people, legalists, to say, how can you say that we're not under the law? It was given by God, you know? So what we say is all scripture is inspired. The totality of the narrative is inspired, but it doesn't all directly teach it it uh you have to take the whole thing and rightly divide it and and properly unfold it and interpret it in light of itself the bible interprets the bible so you know there are psalms for example of david that are clearly his natural understanding in his natural man and his natural feeling and his natural sentiments that are actually contrary to divine revelation when he's really frustrated and expressing the feelings um, and there's places in the Psalms where he's clearly you know got a wrong concept of justification in those feelings you know now did he in an ultimate sense no have a wrong view or something like that no but his feelings come out in those Psalms and they are not all pictures of Christ and 
inspired revelation. We have to interpret the Psalms in the light of the entire narrative of Scripture. If we're going to understand which ones are a type of Christ and which ones, how, how do we interpret the Psalms, you know? So that comes from letting clear doctrine shed light on every portion of Scripture. So we go to places that are clear to clear up places that are confusing or inconsistent with, you know, the whole. Um, and then we find out, okay, there's a hum- there is a human element in some of this. God gave us a record that shows the blemishes of the people. It's very candid. And there's a history. So, th- yes, it all instructs. But in what way? The law was a schoolmaster to lead us to Christ by showing us our need. The law didn't say, hey, you need to go to Christ. No, it did it, it did in an indirect instruction by getting us to try, right? So that we would be experientially taught the conclusion, to, led to the conclusion that Paul finally, with open word and bold speech, clearly says. So, okay, here's a circular logic that I see. I... Like I can have fellowship with someone who says that James is talking about justification before men and can't be talking about faith saving or faith not saving and faith without works not justifying. He's got to be talking about justification by men. But how did they reach that conclusion? They I agree with them that they he, that that Paul's revelation is authoritative. So, but here's what they do. They say James's epistle must be inspired revelation. They start with that assumption. And because they take that for granted, now they have to to say, well, therefore, he can't be disagreeing with Paul. Therefore, what he's talking about can't be the same justification that Paul's talking about. Because James has to agree with Paul that salvation is by faith alone apart from works and just, you know, that it's about all by grace through faith. We have to assume that that's what he believes it, when he's writing this epistle. Why? Because that's what we have to assume because it's in the scripture. So we, that's, not, that's kind of a faulty way of looking at it that takes a dogmatic uh logical approach that says he is inspired therefore he must be right and because he's right he must be talking about something other than what it seems that he's talking about on the surface because he can't disagree with Paul see we set those rules up then we go back and exegete James and say therefore this means this and this means this and this means this but it's all built on assumptions And the people that I see doing this, who I respect and love uh, because they are grace brothers and sisters who do this, and they have a tremendous respect for the word. However, I don't see them taking the book of Acts into account. So they're not, uh, at least to my knowledge, they're not considering the totality based on what Paul talked about in Galatians, which clearly you know that his, the whole Acts 15 conference and everything that led up to it is part of the divinely inspired scripture that we've received and some people so or some things in the Bible are given to us as object lessons and like I said everybody's recorded with blemishes intact So, is James a brother? Yes. Is he a servant of the Lord? Yes. Is he an apostle? I'm not 100% sure. I can't establish it from... I can't, with 100% surety, establish it from the scripture. Um, Okay. So, why did he have all that authority in Jerusalem? You know, there's reasons behind all this. Why did he preside over that conference? Why was Peter afraid of brothers sent from James? And was James clear about justification? Or was he, at that time in Acts 15, content, one of the ones contending with Paul as Paul tried to share his revelation and needed Peter to stand up and speak clearly for grace at that point, which he did. 
seems to me from Acts that James was part of the group that believed that the law of Moses must be kept and that the temple system must be honored. Look at Acts 21, you know. Go take a vow so that you can show the multitudes that you have not apostatized from Moses. So, you know, we have to take that into consideration. Now, when you look at the book of James, that everybody goes to James 2 to, to exegete. But I gave a message about the two mirrors, and I've never heard anyone give that. That in James 1, he shows a man looking at his natural man in the mirror. What is he beholding? That what what is he beholding? The natural man, and what's he talking about? Being a hearer of the word versus being a doer, and he talks about the law, and says that the one who will be blessed is the one who keeps it and does it. Well, there's a problem with that because or I wouldn't say that now see here's where the Holy Spirit is inspiring because there's another mirror where Paul in 2 Corinthians 3 says that we all with unveiled face beholding and reflecting as a mirror the glory of the Lord are being transformed into that same image from glory to glory there is a glory that is shining in the face of Jesus Christ and our transformation comes not as we do but as we behold we behold Christ, and he is transmitted to us. And Second Corinthians 3, the chapter in which that is found, is all about the fact, the contrast between Zion and Sinai, and that in Zion, it's the glory of God shining in the face of Jesus Christ that we behold in the Word. But the ones who do not see this, are, but who are under the law of Moses, are veiled. They're under a ministry of condemnation and death, but I th they think it's a ministry of blessing because it has glory. And the as long as they're under that veil, they don't behold the glory of Christ. What do they behold? Well, they're looking at their performance. What is that? That's the natural man, which Paul reveals cannot receive the things of the Spirit of God and uh, must be crucified. But James has us in James chapter 1 beholding in the same mirror, which is the word, not the glory of God shining in the face of Jesus Christ, but the um, natural man. And we walk away from that mirror, and if we are not, if we are a forgetful hearer, if we do not do, if we hear but do not do, we are like one who looks in a natural in a mirror at his natural man and forgets what kind of manner of man he is. Now the part that's Holy Spirit inspired is that he orchestrated that whole thing to show us these two mirrors. And the contrast between someone who's going to the law looking for something to do so that he may be blessed and someone who has stopped looking at that whole thing and is now looking in the face of Jesus Christ who is the blessing. We are not blessed by what we do. We are blessed in Christ. Now we do things, but we're not ever blessed for them. We're blessed because of Christ. We're blessed with faithful Abraham because we are his seed. That is the source of blessing in the Christian life. And it comes through faith. Now James says that you'll be blessed in your work if you do what the law says. And that when you come to the law, it is a mirror to show you your natural man. Now, he does agree with Paul at one point. He says that uh, if you break the law in one point, you've broken the whole thing. So that's good. But I don't see him saying you need to turn to Christ. You don't see anything in James that indicates that we have been crucified with Christ and that it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. There's nothing in there that does that. And yet you see it in John, Peter, and Paul with different language. They all share that same testimony of Christ in me and that my living must be Christ. So it is either the natural man or Christ, and it is either the law or Christ. Now, I believe James is inspired in the sense that the Holy Spirit has preserved his words and tweaked the his writing so that he would be 
what we what James is is a picture of someone who's tethered to the law and yet he believes in Jesus. So we can see what that looks like. Very godly, very spiritual, right? But there's nothing to follow in there. There's nothing you can do. It doesn't help. That book does not really help you. And they say, well, you know, he was writing to the Jews who were all saying that we're justified by faith so we don't have to do anything. And so he wanted to stir them up to love. Really? No. He's writing to Jews who would have said everybody needs to be circumcised and keep the law of Moses. <laughs> That's probably more the mindset. But he is also flat out speaking a contrary word. You know, if anybody needed to hear justification by faith, it would have been the Jews. And yeah, it was circulating among them because of Paul's ministry. He had not met Paul yet uh, and had this big debate in Acts. I guess he had met Paul Paul uh, because Paul went to Jerusalem once for 15 days and met Peter and stayed with Peter and met James once or twice. But I don't know that Paul had lengthy conversations with him at that point. But he did have disputation with Paul in Acts 15. And finally recognized the grace that was given to Paul, but came up with a compromise and then said everybody's going to become Jewish. You know, they're all going to listen to Moses in the synagogue. And not only that, but this is the raising of the tabernacle of David and the Gentiles are going to come to Israel, just like it says. You know, Jews are, it's it's all his loyalty, the law, Moses and Jew, Judaism and Israel uh is distinctly very pronounced and so if you, you know Paul's word was going out who was saying justification by faith Peter and Paul the, you know James says in the epistle you know what prophet does it have faith you say I have faith you know but you don't have works or whatever and he talks about justification and you know <laughs> He is refuting Paul's language. He's using Paul's language and then arguing against it. That truth wouldn't have been spoken. It's not like in historical, traditional Judaism, people were walking around saying, no, we're justified by faith. I, they were saying we are law keepers. That was the whole point. That was the whole problem. So anyway, um, I have to go, but uh, the... All scripture is inspired and it is there for instruction, but it instructs us in different ways. And in some ways it instructs us by leaving a narrative in place. And yet the Holy Spirit is still there inspiring because, but he's, he's inspiring in a way that James wrote about that natural man looking in the mirror and didn't realize that Paul was going to come along and say something very similar. And yet clearly there's a total difference between those two men and what they see in the mirror. That's the Holy Spirit, obviously. So there's inspiration in that sense. But I don't believe that James is speaking revealed truth from the ascended Christ in heaven about justification. I don't believe that. I don't believe we need justification before men. And in fact, I believe justification before men. How do I know someone's saved? Because they're good? They do good works? A Buddhist does that. They do better than Christians. That's why the gospel wasn't received in China. It was because the morals of Confucius seemed higher to them. But, uh, I mean, it was eventually received in China. That was the resistance it encountered. Good works don't save uh, or, or justify before men without the gospel. The gospel is how I know someone's a believer. What do they pro profess to believe? And then as you dig into what they believe, you say, do they have the testimony of Christ? Now, the... Yes, there are empty believers that don't actually believe, but you'll also find that they're also heretical in the Trinity and they're not you're not able to be orthodox in the sense of keeping the seven ones of the faith in Ephesians, the one faith, the one baptism, the one Lord, the one hope, all that stuff. Uh and have a right view of the the God man and his person and his work and relationship to the Trinity and how salvation works. You're not able to have a right view of that and be saved. It is the profession. It's that profession that helps us to know if someone's actually saved, the, not their works.
Works are never an assurance of salvation for us, and they shouldn't be a furnish of proof for someone else. Although, if we do see someone doing evil works, we should suspect that there's a problem. What you'll find is if you talk to them and really start digging, they're not orthodox. They have a heretical view of some kind. Um, all right, gotta go.